Good morning, everybody. Ah. Morning, Welcome. everyone. <laughs> Welcome to webinar number 36, it Copyright is. and Online Teaching at a Time of Crisis. Um, hopefully not as much crisis as it was. Uh, for, for, for those of you who are joining us today, I'm Chris Morrison. And I'm Jane Secker. And uh, this is Copyright and Online Teaching in a Time of Crisis. And um, we have a very exciting um, session for you today. We have three guest speakers who will be joining us shortly, um, come in, tuning in all the way from uh, Australia. So uh, it's good morning for us, but it's good evening for them. It's a little bit like Eurovision, I was saying, when they first got on the uh, call. Hello, Australia. Can you hear us? Do you have I, I think we could probably say it's good day for everybody. All right. <laughs> on that note, let's move on to what we've got in today's webinar. Some news, as we usually do. Some, some good stuff there. Um, as we said, an update on Australian library copyright reforms from Ben, Trish and Jessica who are joining us today and then a bit on future webinars and what we're planning to do um, in the coming weeks. Right, shall we get started with what we've been doing this week? Yes, let's do that. Yeah, so um, in addition to our webinars or kind of prior to starting our webinars, Chris and I have run this podcast, Copyright Waffle, um, which is actually where the theme tune um, comes from. Um, and um, we've been getting back in the podcast saddle, haven't we, Chris? We've been getting into the swing of things. We have been talking to our copyright heroes, people that we're interested in. Um, this uh, example, this latest episode from Caroline Ball from the University of Derby is a really good one. We've had a lot of uh, people listening to it already and, and giving us some nice comments. Um, Caroline uh, is heavily involved in copyright. She talks about her um, history in fan fiction. That was the subject of her dissertation a number of years ago. But she's also um, heavily involved in Wikipedia. She was Wicked, Wicked Median of the Year um and also uh, involved in the academic ebook investigation campaign so we talk about all of those things it's a really good one isn't it it is it is and um we as we said we're we're back in the um recording zone for these um podcasts and we recorded another one didn't we that is really exciting it's not out yet but it's not out yet yeah it's, it was it's, definitely it, one of our copyright heroes we got to it, speak to it, it's in the can so i think we should i think we should still be teasing it we should wait we will let yeah. you know when the next one's coming up but they they are we, we yeah we're definitely back in the zone and looking to share a lot more of these so Excellent stuff. Uh, what else we've been doing recently? We've been doing a lot of presentations, haven't we? We have. We did a, a, a presentation earlier this week um, at the IPO's Copyright Education Advisory Group, um, giving them a bit of a, a rundown on this webinar series um, and the sort of issues that are coming up in higher education. Um, we also hopped over to Canada, didn't we, briefly? Yep. The jet lag's yep. killing me. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we, yes, we spoke at the ABC conference about the community of practice in the UK and how we've been talking about the copyright issues. Um, had about 180 people joining us there, so that was that was a good session. So, yeah, it's 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 all happening, and we will be talking at the SILIP Copyright Conference on Monday as well on the yes. same topic. So we hope to see some people there. Yeah. Okay, time what. Well, we will remind everyone that we have the archive of all the uh, webinars um, and recordings there. Um, so if you want to go there, that's 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 the, the URL. If you want to pop that in, Jay, I don't know if you've got the URL ready to go, but I think everyone at this stage knows where to find that. So let's move on to. Copyright news, the first item here. Yeah, I think this is me. I'll do it this is. one, Chris. So, hey, um, by all means. This, this is um, actually a special preview of, um, uh, uh, there's a series that's been developed um, by um, Dina, um, oh no, now I've got to pronounce Martuku? it. 
Mark Tsuku, yes, who is, uh, she's one of the lecturers um, in the Department of uh, Library and Information Science at Robert Gordon University. Um, I've known Dina for a really long time for a lot of the work she does about information literacy. Um, she's made um, a sort of cartoon series. It's aimed at um, uh, kids, basically, teaching them about different aspects of information literacy. But her series three is about copyright and she's having a launch event next week. Um, which she was delighted um, that we would advertise here. So it's a kind of special preview event for the copyright geeks. If you want to go along to the session, um, the Eventbrite um, tickets are available and Chris has put the link in the chat. So next week um, on the 12th of May. So another event that's coming up uh, is UCL are putting on and Copyright for Knowledge putting on a session on Brexit and beyond. So what does copyright mean, particularly for researchers? Um, so some excellent speakers. Um, don't say the B word, I've said it unfortunately. Um, Emily Hudson, who is with us today, will be speaking. So uh, always worth tuning in for, um, uh, as well as uh, Ben White will be speaking. So this is really looking at copyright of the research space and what's happening now uh, that we were you know, clearly subject and we are still subject to EU uh, directives in this country, but clearly there's going to be a divergence of what happens next. So that should be a good, uh, a good session. Um, the next one that we've yeah. highlighted is this round table discussion. Yeah, do you want to say something about this one, Chris, or do you want me to? I think this, this is, is a, it's an AHRC funded project, actually, isn't it, towards a national collection. Um, mm -hmm. It's primarily um, aimed at people, I'd say, in the sort of cultural heritage sector, um, but it's going to be a roundtable discussion um, on the 26th of May on copyright and open access. Um, and I don't think the list of speakers has yet to be announced, actually, but it is up on Eventbrite if people are interested um, in that event. And um, I was certainly having a, a quick look into that um, project because, as I say, it's, it seems to be a new funded project um, funded by the AHRC called Towards a National Collection. Um, and about demonstrating good practice in the field of uh, digital cultural heritage. Yeah. So the next item we've got is we've been uh, talking to um, the Educational Recording Agency era about, uh, oh, and learning on screen, we'll come on to that in a moment, um, about uh, what is available under the ERA license. So Helena is uh, here uh, on the call today, the Chief Executive of ERA, um, making us aware that the BBC Shakespeare TV archive is now available on the ERA website. So it supports university teaching and it has here um, a, a, a lot of resources there, historical um, information. So that that link, I think Helen is saying it's not, it will be live from next week, but that's just to let you know that that is there and it's all part of ERA's drive to try to make as much content available. Um, so if there are any questions about that, get in touch with, with ERA. TV and radio goes live at some time next week. Thank you very much for that, Helena. So we just wanted to let you aware of that. And the other update here, we also, I think, have Markida from Learning on Screen, who were the providers of Box of Broadcasts, to say that the BBC Parliament channel is now available globally via Box of Broadcasts. Any UK registered student with a uh, BOB subscription can get access to that. Um, so again, there's the link through to um, the Learning on Screen, uh, Bob On Demand page there. For those of you, I think most of us are familiar with that. So, um, any questions about that? Mark Eder's on hand if you want to drop something in the chat. Mm. Um, and Helen as well, and just pop yeah, something yeah. in the chat there. So, yeah, if, if anyone wants to ask anything about those two services, um, let us know. It's also something we could pick up at the end of the session as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. And the final thing we wanted to have in the news section is just a reminder that. I can't believe it's not Icebox's contributions to the world's only international copyright literacy event with playful opportunities for practitioners and scholars. 
um, happening at the end of June, Friday the 25th of June. We've got some really great submissions already. We will be running it as an online event, um, but we very much looking forward to your contribution if you've got something to share. Yeah, so. and the call for contributions closes, I think, on the 24th of May. So you still got mm -hmm. a couple of weeks. Uh, but for those of you who have enjoyed coming along to the webinars, on Friday the 25th of June, you can spend the day with us. So lots of fun possibly the evening even we are we do have something planned we do yes okay so I think it's time to introduce our three speakers we have already uh, mentioned that uh, we're very very excited to have um, not just a double act but a triple act from um, three of the kind of Australian um, experts in the field of copyright so we have um, Ben Rice who's the copyright law and policy advisor at the Australian Libraries Copyright Committee joining us we have Trish Hepworth who's the director of policy and education at the Australian Library and Information Association and we have Jessica Coates who's the Senior Rights Advisor at the National Library of Australia. Um, we're going to stop sharing our slides and we're going to hand over to them. I think you're going to talk um, the three of you in succession so I'm not sure I think I'm handing over is it to Ben first um, but I'll, I'll let you take the mic and we're just so excited that you've joined us um, and, uh, you know, uh, looking forward to what you have to tell us about what's been going on, you know, in, in your world around copyright online learning and the kind of whole, you know, shift um, that we've had in the last year or so. I was on mute. <laughs> uh, I think Trish is right. I think um, the plan is for me to start off. Um, uh, so, uh, as uh, Jane said, I uh, this is Jessica. I am the um, I am the senior rights advisor at the National Library of Australia. Um, uh, but in fact, my background is that I used to have Ben's job um, before he did, and Trish used to have that job before I did. So, what you're seeing is a series of three people who've been around the copyright policy area in Australia for quite an advocacy for quite a very long time. Um, uh, a good uh, we cover about the last decade but what we were focusing on today is what happened last year in Australia um, so we're going to do a slightly sequential thing again every um, uh, once again I'm starting again because I have um, uh, because I was the person in at the Australian Libraries Copyright Committee uh, and the Australian Digital Alliance which is the advocacy group the um, sister group of the Australian Libraries Copyright Committee um, I was working for them when COVID hit, uh, and I kind of initiated what we did. Uh, and then Ben's go and then Trish is going to take over to talk about a bit about what the rest of the sector um, did. She's now working for Alia, the Australian Libraries Information Online. They had, took a very key role um, in some of the early initiatives. And Ben's going to talk about what's happening now and into the future. Um, but we're going to try to keep it short and casual, as you can tell. No slides, um, all very nice. Um, so. Uh, essentially, Australia uh, is doing very well with COVID now. We cannot complain. We recognise that um, uh, we have uh, we we're in a much different situation than much of the world. Though I think everybody's slowly moving to a really good spot now. But uh, you know, back a year and a bit ago, uh, Australia went into full lockdown in March 2020, just along with everybody else, and that included shutting all the physical facilities of all the libraries um, across Australia. So, for example, the National Library, where I work now, was um, shut close to the public on 16 March, and it would have been one of the last ones. Um, so the most immediate concern um, across the whole sector was how much, how could we continue to supply material? Um, and initially, of course, the big focus of that was on how can we do that under the current law? So this is where I came in as the, um, at the time, the senior advisor for the Australian Libraries Copyright Committee. What that organisation does is it acts as both an advocate and an educational group. So it does a lot of um, fact sheets, um, training, et cetera, like that for Australia's library community and copyright. So it was a very logical first um, place for everybody to turn for information. And we felt, you know, very clearly that we had an important role that we needed, you know, we needed to step up basically. Um, so uh, 
what we did straight away is we had we got a blog post out. Our blog post was out by 24th March, so uh, you know eight days later, um, and it basically set out the basic rules under Australian copyright law of what you could do now to provide materials in an electronic environment if you're closed physically. Um, we circulated it through our networks, and then after that, um, we followed it up with webinars, uh, uh, which were some of our most popular ever. It was really a, a very big, a, you know, an excellent introduction to webinars for everybody. Um, and we collaborated with groups like uh, the Council of Australian University Libraries and Smart Copying, who work for the um, uh, schools, do copyright for the schools. Um, and we basically tried to get that out as far as possible and do webinars for them and provide information directly to as many people as we possibly could. Um, we also, of course, got a lot of emails looking for advice, which we did not provide. We provided general information because we don't pr provide legal advice, but we did our best to answer um, uh, people's questions and to really help them with um, particular situations that they brought up. Um, so on one level, the message that we were sending out was actually pretty good. Um, Australia has a very long tradition of having quite good laws for remote access to um, copyright material, um, particularly uh, where we're talking about document delivery, you know, so where it's actually in response to a request for research. Um, uh, and that's because uh, even right back even when we were being written in 1968, people, there was kind of a bit of recognition in our law that if you're going to get material out to the other side of the country, uh, you know, to very remote areas and stuff like that, you do need a bit more flexibility than countries where you can genuinely drive between cities and things like that. So, um, uh, and that was all updated for the digital environment. So, in fact, it was not too hard for libraries to keep providing research material in response to requests for research. So that was fairly covered. Um, unfortunately, uh, stories, everything else was not quite as clear. Um, we did have, uh, so that was, um, the story for uh, research libraries like the National Library was very good, but for other libraries, it was not quite as clear how well they could work. There was, we do have a flexible dealing exception that we call Section 200 AB. It essentially acts like a fair use for um, uh, libraries, um, you know, non-commercial fair use for libraries. So um, you can do a lot of things under this exception as long as it's for the, you know, purpose of ma of maintaining and operating a library um, or or an educational institution. It covers both. Um, so under that exception, a lot of our national and state institutions, these same big research libraries, did already have a fair amount of material online. And we saw an immediate increase in access to them. Same with everybody else. I'm sure all countries found this uh, where we, uh, you know, uh, it's particularly really popular resources. Some of our most popular at the National Library got more than a 40 percent increase in April alone. So that was from March to April, like a really big um, jump. Um, so, and one really fun uh, da piece of data that we have coming out of that um, time was the fact that the materials, some of the materials that had the biggest jumps were um, materials that we had that focused on, um, that were things you could do at home. So we have the archive version of Ravelry, which is a knitting social media site, and that had a massive jump, and also our mu sheet music website, 56% um, in April, June, uh, increase in April, June. So that was really cool. Um, so there's some good stories there. Um, however, uh, providing materials beyond these kind of existing collect online collections or in response to a direct request for research material was much trickier. So where it really became very challenging was for groups like the universities and the schools who were trying to provide information for students in particular uh, or, you know, um, on other ongoing um, contacts. So um, the unis are the ones that I know the most about and have the most contact with. Um, and I do know that they uh, they did, of course, have a lot of electronic resources like every other you know university in the world. Um, I think it was up to 80 percent even of materials were now online um, in an electronic form. But of course, they were all under license and we don't have a uh, contractual override clause like you guys have in the U um, in the UK. Uh, so it. Uh, the licenses could exclude any exceptions that would let them supply this material more broadly. And of course, a lot of those licenses also uh, restricted off-site access. So they were restricted to only on-site um, 
access. The good news is that, as you guys know, um, a lot of the publishers really stepped up to the mark during COVID and uh, expanded licenses to let you go further. So that worked well. Um, but there were, of course, a lot of gaps where uh, there were some publishers that did not do that and there were places where universities were paying, you know, very large fees for resources that they essentially could not use anymore because nobody could come on campus and they couldn't provide it off-site, off-campus. Um, uh, so that was one uh, disadvantage. Um, people basically started looking at things like controlled digital lending or talking about them, uh, the, you know, the kind of activities that were done in the US. Um, there's an argument, depending on who you are, is that this would could be permitted under this flexible dealing. As we said, it's a flexible exception, it's quite broad. Um, uh, but uh, the library sector as a whole did not choose, chose not to go down that path for many reasons. Um, and not the least of that um, because of relationships that we have, of course, and, uh, not, and wanting to make sure that we were, um, uh, you know, really being fair. And we wanted to see if there was uh, some way that we could uh, come up with other solutions. Um, uh, the public libraries also started to look at to see how they could support their um, their communities more directly and uh, things like story times. We all know that story time became a very hot topic um, for people at home and can we can pre keep providing story times to our communities. Um, and they were looking for a solution to that. Once again, uh, possibly allowed under Section 200 AB, but were they willing to go there? Like, did they want to do it unilaterally? Um, and this is where I thought that I might hand over to Trish about some of the solutions that people started to look at uh, to uh, see how they could possibly, you know, solve some of these gaps in our law uh, through alternative answers. There you go. Thank you, Jessica. Yes, I will absolutely pick up with online story time. So as Jessica mentioned, Australia, like most places in the world, went into a beautiful uh, lockdown in March. And one of the biggest issues, obviously, around a lockdown where people could not come physically into the library, which may had a particular impact on programs. So, and one of the biggest programs, the most beloved programs within the public library service obviously being story time and at the same time we had a million frantic parents at home who were suddenly juggling a shift to working at home with apparently keeping their children safe and amused and happy at home and it, the library services had a lot of people who really wanted to be doing something so online story time seemed like the logical step as Jessica said you could argue that potentially this was allowed already, but what we preferred to do was go down the route of negotiating in good faith with everybody. And so Jessica might have mentioned that the NLA closed down on the 17th of March. It was one of the last, but on the 18th of March, the day after, we announced the agreement for online story time. And so that was Alia, the Australian Bookseller Associate, Booksellers Association, the Australia Publishers Association, the Australian Society of Authors, or the ABA, the APA, and the ASA, because we like our acronyms to be all very confusingly the same. And that agreement basically said that uh, libraries could film one of their stuff, reading the story, they could put it up online, and that people would be able to view it. And it was done. The, the the agreement was actually made by the publishers uh, on behalf of the whole cohort uh, with the support of the booksellers and the Australian, um, the Australian Society of Authors. And that went really well. And originally when we launched it, we said for the duration of the pandemic, which as everyone would know, is still going on. But as Australia opened up and we lost restrictions through the, basically in the entire country. So, um, and overall now our public library is back open and foot traffic's about 70%. So it's still below, but it is definitely rising quickly. So towards the end of last year, when the libraries were opening up, the, the publishers and the ASA and the ABA began to get a bit near about the sort of agreement that we'd come to. But at the same time, the libraries had found this new audience and this new product they liked. And one of the things that I'm sure it wasn't just us that found during COVID was in doing online story time, 
initial thought had been, well, these are the people who can't come into the library. And then the audience they found were people sometimes who couldn't come into the library ever. So it was people who had, who lived regionally and remote, too far away to make it ever into online story time. It was people who had a disability that prevented them. It was people who lived with people with limited mobility. So from all of this, we had the idea that, yes, something should happen, but it needed to change. And I will say I'm taking all the credit for this because Ben was the one who actually helped negotiate the agreement. But we managed to reach an agreement with them that we would basically run a trial run uh, of this to expand this program. So currently, the program, and I'll drop a link in the chat in a second, the program is administered by Alia. And what happens is a library branch pays $165 which includes GST, and for that amount of money for the next 12 months, they can film them, uh, film themselves doing online story time, put a recording up online, try and geographically limit it to Australia because that's where the publishers obviously have the rights, uh, and it can only stay up for six months. And importantly, it has to come from a list of that we had. And so we were all a little bit worried about how it was all going to go. Would people be interested? How would it go? I can tell you some headlines. Oh, uh, then now I'm going, have I lost people? Am I still talking? Yeah. We can hear you. We can, um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, you just cut out. That's okay. <laughs> Um, we've got about a third of the libraries, public libraries in Australia who have signed up. We've got uh, almost 250 different titles from some of the biggest publishers. We should be returning somewhere between forty dollars to $60,000 back to the publishers and the publishers then through their agreements back to the authors. So it's been an absolute resounding success. And one thing I did just want to note too is when we negotiated this, we um, both because it was definitely allowed under some of our provisions, but also because we're good faith, we've made it really clear that uh, accessibility provisions such as providing Auslan are allowed to go along with this. So that's online story time. It was a lovely little bit of negotiation that just basically played on our very good relationships, but it'll be interesting to see where it goes. It's a 12 month trial and we'll see what happens. The other thing I just wanted to very quickly mention now is segueing into, well, then what does the future hold? One of the other big things that turned up was our issue around lending rights. Uh, so Australia has a system of lending rights that is not dissimilar to some others in the world, but is definitely one just for us. It is the gov. We have two different schemes for lending rights. We have a public lending right and an educational lending right. So a public lending right for books within the public library system, educational for schools, TAFEs and universities. It's funded by the government to the tune of about $22 million every year and it's done on holdings. So what happens is every year we do a survey of the library services. Any book that has more than 50 copies in a library gets put on the list and then we distribute money depending on how many books they've got. When co one of the things about it is it only pertains to physical books. And when COVID hit, obviously people were no longer borrowing physical books. Uh, and we saw upticks somewhere between 100 to 400% upticks in digital loans, which are not currently covered by lending rights. So the Australian Society of Authors in particular is very keen to see our lending rights scheme expanded to include ebooks and audiobooks. And so that is one thing that the libraries have swung in support. We have been hesitant, I will say, up until now, mainly because of the different way in which libraries are sold ebooks, which means that they do have that limit often to the number of times that they can be borrowed or the number of people who can read them. However, with the increasing move towards digital, we think there are now ways that we can look at what the sort of bulk of books is and do something similar on holdings rather than doing it per loan and that the inclusion of without the inclusion of ebooks and audiobooks we actually risk uh, a weird distribution uh, of the lending rights money 
out towards our Australian authors and publishers. And I will just mention that is the final most important bit of our lending rights scheme, which is because it's not copyright based, it's just a payment done on holdings in libraries. We can restrict it to only Australian authors and Australian publishers. So in some ways, it's the single biggest bit of funding that our government gives to Australian literature. So that's one thing we are pushing to get on the agenda this year. And I'm going to hand over to Ben to do the actual copyright and more fun things that we're pushing for. Thanks, Trish. Yes, yeah, on to the, 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 the fun part, the, the copyright reform that everyone loves so much. Um, uh, yeah, so um, we uh, are currently going through a, a copyright reform process. So um, uh, the Paul Fletcher, who is the Minister for Communications, uh, the Arts, Cities, Infrastructure and Urban Development now, um, it's quite a wordy um, title, uh, announced the reforms uh, back in August last year and at the time uh, COVID was used uh, as um, uh, as one of the reasons for, for, for the reforms why they were being brought about um, the, um, you know at, at this time but actually um, there is sort of a continuation of the almost endless series of copyright reforms that we've been going through um, uh, in a I just want to make sure everyone can see me. Oh, everyone's got me. Great. <laughs> Sorry, Emily. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the reforms now um, uh, are sort of a, the, the continuation of a, of a long process that's been going on um, back even before 2012 when we had the Australian Law Reform Commission um, conduct a, a really extensive review of our copyright framework. Um, uh, for which there was no um, formal response by the government to. Um, uh, the problem was sort of kicked along down the line to the um, uh, to a, a further inquiry by the Productivity Commission, uh, which again made a, a long series of recommendations that included Australia adopting a system of fair use. Uh, and, uh, and in 2018 and 19, again, we had another suite of, of copyright reforms, uh, the Copyright Modernization Review that again looked at all of um, all of the issues that were touched on, including, um, again, whether Australia should introduce um, a fair use, uh, as well as a, a suite of other um, questions that came up. Um, so this current um, set of reforms is designed to um, uh, to <laughs> so so many reviews, and uh, so this this current set of reforms uh, is really designed um, to um, uh, to mark the government's response to to those um, uh, to, to to the to the the many reviews that we've had um, leading up to this. Um, so what we have, um, uh, rather than the um, a broad wholesale um, uh, review of the Copyright Act that includes all the wonderful things that we've been pushing for for a very long time here in Australia, including fair use. Um, what we have is a, a set of fairly narrowly drafted purpose-based um, uh, uh, reforms and, and changes to the Act that are designed to um, better increase online access to, to content. Um, so uh, a couple of things that are included um, uh, in the reforms, um, a, a limited liability scheme for, for the use of orphan works, um, and uh, that will apply to, to schools and libraries, um, uh, as well as interestingly, sort of um, some commercial uses. So for example, documentary filmmakers, um, um, other uses along those lines as well. Um, the ADA had been pushing and, and the ALCC um, for a long time had been pushing for um, uh, a broader um, uh, exception for the use of orphan works. Um, instead, what, we've, what we have in, in these reforms is a, is a limited liability scheme um, that obviously shields institutions and users from, from liability for using um, uh, works where an owner might later come forward to, to claim ownership. Um, provided that the, the institution or, or the user um, ceases to use um, use that that material, it raises a whole bunch of questions about um, you know how that would work in practice. For example, you know a, a documentary film that's put together um, 
uh, based on a you know that, that incorporates a, a series of off at works it could be quite difficult um, to, to to remove some of that material. So it'll be interesting to see how um, um, factors like that are, are worked through um, regarding the the off and work scheme. Um, some of the interesting parts that um, are specifically designed for, for libraries and archives are around um, uh, providing online access to parts of the collection that libraries hold um, and extending um, the exceptions that allow libraries to um, uh, provide access to um, uh, not just um, literary works but to audiovisual material as well. Um, this again comes back to, to Trisha's point around the, um, uh, one of the, the, the benefits from story time, I guess, that um, uh, while the move to online story time was designed to address the, um, the COVID issue of libraries being shut down, um, you know, in practice, what you see is, is a, a whole range of communities being able to get access to material that they otherwise weren't able to, to get access to. Um, uh, so people who live um, rurally and, and in remote communities, especially, um, it's a big issue that we have in Australia. Obviously, it's a fairly large place. Um, you know, often diff really difficult to to get into a local library to get physical access to material. Um, and so, what these exceptions are designed to do is to provide um, um, libraries the ability to to digitise some of that content. Um, and make it available with appropriate you know, protections in place for, for rights owners as well. Um, one of the other interesting parts of the reform is this uh, is a, um, a, a fair dealing exception for non-commercial quotation, um, which is designed uh, to apply to um, for um, library users and education users. Um, it doesn't apply um, um, it doesn't apply very widely, and, and from what we understand, appears like it will be um, it will be drafted fairly narrowly as well. Um, so some more information yet there still to come out. I should say as well, we're we're waiting to see an exposure draft of the bill um, uh, to to find the. Uh, the uh, I guess the devil will be in the detail in a lot of parts of the reforms is is currently our thinking. I might stop there and see if there are any questions from anyone. Thanks very much, Ben. Yeah, so if there are any questions, that would be useful to, to, to ask them. I've, um, I have got a question myself um, as well. I see that we've, we've got a question uh, that's come up. But my question actually is in relation to um, specific education um, and use of, of uh, material, copyright material for education purposes. So you've mentioned the quotation exception there, which um, you said may be quite narrowly drawn, but there are some proposed provisions for something equivalent to our illustration for instruction in the UK, but um, I believe those are quite narrowly drawn as well. Is that correct? And could you talk to us a bit about that? Yeah, look, most of the um, most of the exceptions do seem to be quite narrowly um, narrowly drafted at, at, at the moment. Again, you know, compared to um, uh, where we were originally trying to to push the government to land in terms of um, fair use or even fair dealing for education, um, you know, as a as a second best option. Um, uh, the the reforms that are that are being presented now, you know, across the across the board, do seem to be um, fairly narrowly drafted. Um, well, will be fairly narrowly drafted. At this point, it's 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 pretty hard to to say until we actually see um, how the um, how the provisions are, are worded on paper. Um, but we're hoping that uh, you know, in the next um, at least in the next month or so, we'll be able to to, to see some. Um, see some draft legislation. Ben, can you correct me if I'm wrong, but is it accurate to say that the education ones that are being proposed, even though they're quite narrow, one of the reasons why they're narrow is they're, uh, they're 
aimed at very specific issues that were that we already knew existed but they were highlighted during COVID um, and like gaps in the system. So the idea is that they should work in concert with exceptions we already have. So uh, even if we don't have the broad fair dealing for education, there's an argue, uh, hopefully some of these will, they'll, they'll uh, you know, work like a jigsaw to kind of give us a better um, outcome than we have it currently. Does that sound about right? Yeah, definitely. I think the the um, certainly the outcome of, of these reforms is going to be a um, will be a will be a lot better. I mean, we're currently in a in a position with the um, uh, with the way um, schools are able to use copyright material here in, in online teaching, where um, it's currently a grey area whether you know the use of that material applies or, um, or whether the exceptions that allow use of that material in the classroom would apply um, online, um, so would apply when when being taught outside of outside of the school, um, and indeed whether they'd even apply um, uh, when an outside audience is is involved um, in the in the provision of education. So um, uh, it makes it really difficult for anything like school and industry collaborations. Um, you know, theoretically. Um, uh, some of these exceptions might not apply when when someone from outside the school is involved in the in the teaching of the lesson. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. And I note as well that Emily's uh, put a comment in the chat to say that the the Australian approach is to amend your version of of what we have in Section thirty four in the UK Act, and and Section thirty four is very much framed as on the premises of an educational institution to showing, playing, performing, and that it's broadening that out, hopefully, but but certainly we, we, we've had to, even though we have had our laws updated more recently and were supposed to reflect the digital reality of teaching and access to content, we find ourselves that jigsaw that you've described it never quite <laughs> the, the pieces don't quite fit do they some overlap and there are some gaps and you have to sort of fill in those bits so i think that's very yeah interesting to hear that even though you're going through that process there are some things which uh, are still probably not going to be perfect are they we, we have some very clever uh, copyright advisors for our education groups so we uh, ha fingers crossed that that, um, that you know once they see the legislation it will align with what they're looking for this is what we're hoping we'll see great thank you okay thanks yeah thanks um can i pick up the question that we got in the chat which was from um alison um uh, alison fullard um saying question from south africa were academic libraries choosing to scan specific chapters of print titles to send to students we um have had on our webinars quite a bit of chat about um what some universities in the uk called scan and deliver after uh, a sort of 1980s uh, uk pop star adamant they were using the well, we all love adamant yeah 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 <laughs> those of us um, who are old enough <laughs> yeah, it's a bit, a bit, some great uh, videos and things doing the rounds um, about these. But did you have any of these um, sort of scan and um, deliver type services in Australia for students? I'm happy to answer that one because I was talking to them quite a lot then. Um, I've been and Trisha are okay with that. Um, uh, which is, I think it changed a little bit from institution to institution. There wasn't a concerted sector wide approach on that. Um, but as I said, our laws for document delivery would allow a library to, uh, or an archive to do that uh, if it was only one chapter um, that you can actually uh, if it was in response to a request the problem that our um, libraries and archives uh, that our uni libraries had was about pr putting chapters up online or, or whole books up online for students who didn't have physical copies um, for a whole class for instance but if it's in response to a specific request you're actually totally allowed to do that under our existing law um, and have been for a very long time. Um, my understanding though is that different institutions uh, utilise this dif in different ways. So uh, I think there were some that were doing, uh, you know, if you ask we will send you a copy. Uh, and there were other ones that came up with broader solutions that were more about putting up whole, you know, chapters or whatever as, as re were required. Um, um, I don't know what is allowed under our statutory licence as well as some other people. So I don't know if Trish or Ben feel more confident talking about this. But it is actually, I think it is quite possible that under statutory licence, you were able to do 
uh, some copying online for classes in, in, on a chapter by chapter basis anyway. Um, so I think that yeah. it didn't come up so much as an issue here and it certainly didn't become a sector wide issue. No. I, I would say that, to be honest, of all the things that is going through in our uh, copyright reforms, the the changes to document delivery, which means that we will stop it, we will stop the requirement that if you take a digital copy of something to make to do a document delivery, then the library has to destroy that digital copy, even if it's particularly precious and the first time something's ever been digitised or anything else. That is going in our copyright reforms if everything goes according to plan. And I know it's a really little silly thing, but actually that will be the thing that I'm probably happiest about because it annoys me so much. Very good. Um, OK, um, th there's a question from Emily here about whether you uh, would f uh, be able to comment on the litigation between Universities Australia and Copyright Agency over the terms of the their higher education scanning license. Does somebody want to pick that up? <laughs> ben, is, ben is the only one who might be authorised to say anything. I'm not sure how much he's allowed to say. <laughs> well, I don't know how much I'm authorised to say <laughs> either, actually, which is never a great <laughs> position to be in. I mean, <laughs> what I can say is that um, um, the 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 universities are expecting a decision from the federal court to be handed down. Sorry, from the copyright tribunal um, to be handed down. Um, it, it could be any day now, um, um, and I get the feeling that 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 will have some. Um, obviously, depending on the result, will have some you know wide ranging implications for the way that the. Um, statutory license operates for, for university copying. <laughs> okay, thanks for that, Ben. And I, I know that's put you on the spot. And I know that we have James Bennett here, who is the head of rights and licensing at the Copyright Lic Licensing Agency in the UK. So just just for, for everyone's benefit, to the, the the history of this is in in many countries around the world, we have representatives of the universities talking to. The collective management organisation that, that represents print, uh, book, journal publishers. So we, um, in in the UK, we had litigation back around the year 2000, um, where there was a copyright tribunal case that kind of set the scene for what happens in the UK. And that since then, um, we've been able to continue negotiating a, a license without needing to to resort to to uh, litigation. But in Australia, there were some points of principle around reporting and around other aspects of the license where it, it, both parties could not come to an agreement and that that has led to this litigation so yeah just just i think that jane did you want to come in on that no all i was going to just say was um that uh there, there's been another a, a question from philippa but i think jessica's answered that in the chat which is about the document delivery um laws and i think um that's that's really helpful she's pointed um out a, a resource that might help Phil philippa out um interpreting australian copyright law i'm not quite sure are you planning a move to australia philippa are you looking into <laughs> <laughs> into library loans i i got a, a, a plain not plain english summary but um trish may be excited by the getting rid of the destroying bit but i'm excited by the modernization of document delivery and interlibrary loan uh because basically the reforms that Ben talked about that happened in 2017 modernised our preservation exceptions and turned them from these old clunky ones that basically said you can make one preservation copy once something has already been lost, stolen or damaged, which is a great time to start preserving things, um, and, uh, and turned them into like this really nice, simple, only a few lines, clear, broad exception. Uh, and they're planning on doing the same thing with our document delivery laws. So. With our current ones, I agree, are very old and clunky and they go for a page and a half and they're extremely confusing. But what they basically say is you can copy up to 10% or a chapter of any published work um, in re for research and study and send it to anybody just like in any form, you know, any kind of electronic way. Um, or you can copy more than that if it's not commercially available. It's actually, they're really, they've got horrible, weird admin things, but they've got a quite a 
a lot of power. And the modern, the modernized version is supposed to extend that also to audio visual materials and um, I think to unpublished materials as well uh, and to private use. So it could be a really powerful exception that, you know, comes very close to uh, a lot of the things, um, the exciting things people are doing around the world. Um, if, it get, if we get it right, we'll have to see. Um, yeah. But in the meantime, uh, Lib Copyright Dog Day is definitely your best place for resources on uh, Australian copyright law. <laughs> on, on that note, on that note, one thing that, that Jane and I have both reflected on is um, how well organised uh, you you um, you are in Australia in getting the library community, uh, the work that that you all do in upskilling the community to understand the current existing laws, to advocate effectively for reform, even though the process of reform can be quite difficult and ultimately come to compromised outcomes. But can you just tell us a bit actually about how, you know, the National Library works with the, the, the Library and Information Association and the creation of having a, a copyright committee and, and kind of how that came about and how that is sustained? Because I think it's something that, you know, we, we have bodies in the UK, but it doesn't seem that they're quite as coordinated or perhaps sustainably resourced as no, in that's Australia. Exactly what, that's exactly what I was going to say. I think it's about what we can learn from you. And I know people will say, oh, well, you're a smaller country than us. And, you know, it's more mm. complicated in the UK. But I, I really do think that it, it is something where we're really keen to learn from the countries that seem to be doing this really well and coordinating things. Because, you know, just just trying to pull together the kind of copyright community in the UK is really difficult. It's really challenging. I, I, I'm going to jump in again because I was in charge of the ALCC during the 20th anniversary, so I know the history. It's actually again on the uh, libcopyright.org.au uh, site. Um, uh, but basically, uh, the ALCC is at least 30 years old now. Um, but it started off just as an association. It was just like, you know, a, a you know, volunteer collection of um, different groups. And it was around 98. Um, and I think in the lead up to that, but 98 is when it started to really solidify um, it, when the groups who were already involved with that, which were mainly the university libraries, the national and state libraries and ALIA, as well as other smaller groups, but they were the three key um, funders and founders really of the ALCC. Um, they wanted to, they wanted to work more in advocacy and be stronger in advocacy um, work. And they realized that they needed to start dealing with other communities who like them. So the education groups, I mean, they already had good relations with them, but they wanted to um, really beef the ability for all those organizations to work together, education, um, disability groups, um, and and the other GLAM institutions, so museums, etc. cetera. Um, and so a group of copyright people, not that large a number, um, you know, 10 to 15 or so from different institutions and universities and things like that um, from around Australia who had a strong interest, all got together and came up with this idea of setting up the Australian Digital Alliance, which is the sister organisation. Um, and the way they set it up was the Australian Digital Alliance and the Australian Libraries Copyright Committee would share and would both be funded organisations. They share an employee, which is Ben. Um, <laughs> ben. Um, and uh, they and what made it sustainable is that they were funded entirely on membership um, fees. So a few uh, different levels of membership fees for different groups, depending on your size and your funding and your commitment and things like that. But essentially, both organisations have a very stable um, membership base and that provides kind of the stability that you needed and the fact that they shared this one employee. So it really keeps costs down. Um, so I'd say that's the two key things. Um, and the fact, the thing that's really kept them going has been the buy-in from uh, certain sectors, particularly say the university libraries, they are very strong supporters and the university librarians are our largest numbers in our communities of both organisations. Um, so uh, it's just about that once the organisations came, we were able to attract enough people to keep us going, I think is a way to think of it. What do you guys think, Trish and Ben? Oh, look, City speaking as one of the organisations that currently uh, is the member organisation. Uh, definitely, I, I think Jessica's spot on. I think one thing from the organisational point of view is that you can see it as an investment because you think about how much money you would have to spend as an organisation to do your copyright advocacy and to do your copyright training. 
And the fact that the ALTC doesn't just do the advocacy, but also does the policy work and does the training, they are things that we would have to resource otherwise out from ourselves. So it's a very easy, it's a very easy calculation, I guess, for the organisations that it's much a good cost benefit to be long to the organisation. Plus, it means we get to put somebody really good whose sole job is to think about copyright all day. And that gives a lot more strength than if we try to split it up across us. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. For that. I think it is, it is a, um, it, it's a really good model, I think, to look at. And I think one of the things we reflect on is the UK. We, do, we have a lot of people working in this space. Um, and but we have a lot of the work going on more on, on a voluntary capacity where people are doing it on top of of other jobs and I think that makes Absolutely. it difficult to actually contain to have that continuity as you can see the three of you have all been through the, the working in that same post and that you're all bringing that knowledge together where you're working across those organizations so that, it, it's good to see yeah really good really good um we've just got um about three or four minutes left if anyone has got any more questions if anyone wants to come on the mic um to ask anything um pop your hand up or or just grab the mic um but um is there anything else you wanted to ask chris um i, I mean I I, I I i suppose i do have a, a maybe a fairly technical question about section 200 <laughs> ab um I you did I and you did. i mean just go back as jessica you said that was something where people in in the library community felt comfortable with uh, using that during the time of of the pandemic but now you're in the next step i know that there's some ambiguity around that it does include wording that comes from the firm three-step test that could be seen as restrictive also referring to emily mm -hmm. hudson's excellent book drafting copyright exceptions which she talks about mm -hmm. this in depth and has um uh, you know information data gathered from from practitioners working in Australia, but where does that? Where do you sit with that now? Is this is this a helpful thing to you going forward to have the flexibility for a new kind of um, paradigm of how libraries operate post COVID? Yes. Um, so uh, um, yeah, mixed views about Section Two Hundred AB. Emily is totally right, uh, and we Emily gave a presentation on it at in, at the ADA's um, conference only last week. So conveniently, we're all up to update on it. Um, but Emily is totally right about how. Uh, badly written <laughs> Section 200 OB is to a certain degree and how complex and confusing and how much how many problems that has caused at times with its application. But having said that, in some sectors, particularly the big national and state libraries, um, over the, la over the uh, 16 years that it's existed, um, uh, they've become much more comfortable with it um, and uh, and more of the sector is as well. So it is quite widely used now, uh, just depends on who you are and how confident you are and things like that. And so uh, we would far prefer to have a fair use or even a fair feeling library archive and, we, and that's in our written submission. So I'm not, um, you know, I'm not spilling anything, but um, if you are not, if you, are not afraid of Section 200 AB, it is quite good. It's got quite powerful. Um, once Now that it's been around so long, it's been used so much and we've got more evidence of how it might be used and nobody's been sued for using it, using it um, it's become more stronger and better. It's better than nothing. Fair enough. So I, I suppose a bit like a bit like my washing machine, it makes a horrible noise. It's not perfect, but it still, it still works. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I'd um, add and, and, is this, and if, if we've got... People are using it. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things to add that we think um, uh, that the current reforms might help with. So one of the um, subsections of, of 200 AB, subsection six, says that you can't rely on, on section 200 AB if you can rely on another section of the Act. And what that means is that for um, uh, practitioners um, who aren't lawyers um, reading that, who think, well, you know, maybe my use um, fits within one of the preservation exceptions or, or might just fit within um, uh, an, an, another exception under the Act, um, but, but, I, but can't quite be 100% sure, they feel really uncertain about then relying on, on Section 200AB as well. So if we can get rid of that subsection 
um, that would clarify that that you can rely on on 200 AB and potentially another section of the Act. It would make it a lot more effective in practice, I think. But um, I'm nervous saying anything about 200 AB with Emily um, Hudson listening. So. Um, <laughs> She can jump in there if I'm. Um, I think on that note, wrong. we are we are we are now I think out of time. Um, so I think uh, if we were to have a, a, a discussion about 200 AB in 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 detail, maybe we could arrange another session. We're certainly talking with Emily about about doing some session specific looking on on the um, on the on the insights that we can gain from from her research. So we we definitely I would say we come back to this at another time. But I would just like to say at this point. Thank you so much for joining us and giving us this overview of, of where you are in Australia, the things that have happened over the last year or so, and how you've established yourself and on things, how things are looking in the future. So thanks again for taking time out of your evening to join us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for giving up Friday. That's been really yeah. fantastic. Thanks, Sarah. So, yeah. Thanks, thanks for thank making you. copyright look so cool. Much more cool. Well, <laughs> hang, hang around for our last bit. Uh, don't disappear. We're, we're, yep. it's, it's back to us. And uh, you'll, you'll think we're even more cool then, or, or maybe oh, not. I did, no, I doubt it. I doubt it very much. Right. So let us jump back into our slides. We just want to say, um that we do have future sessions planned so future webinars um we the next one is taking place on the 21st of may um we do we are asking uh, one uh, speaker or set of speakers to join us but we don't want to say until we've confirmed that they will be definitely joining us if they can't make it we, we we can always go ahead it may be an opportunity for a general discussion i've got this planning for online learning in next academic year at the bottom a future topics list is this something Absolutely. people feel that they would like to so it's certainly something i'm doing a lot of work on at the moment at kent but yeah, we yeah. definitely have on the 11th of june at 2 p.m british summer time 2 p.m because we have american colleagues joining us it's the legend that is peter yazi as long along with his colleagues will cross meredith jacob and, and pru adler who have worked on the most recent code of best practice in fair use but this one is in open educational resources we've mentioned this on the um on the, the webinar in the past we are also going to have bart maletti uh, joining us uh with a colleague he's been working with in europe on a potential code across europe for documentary film use so there's a there's a lot of stuff in here about how mm -hmm. uh, we can work with communities to make copyright legislation interpretable and use copyright exceptions even if we don't have fair use so a lot of stuff in there so definitely date for your diary that one isn't it i think yeah yeah, yeah. but we've got other topics and we're we're always looking for speakers so drop us a line um, mm -hmm. if there's something i know a couple of people have asked if they they want to talk a bit about uh, how they're making use of the cla license um and that might be something we can bring james in for and do a session on um if if uh, you know in light of the fact that extension is ending in uh, july of this year so yeah Okay, we've just got one more thing to leave people with. Do we stop the recording now? Though, or, uh... I think I think we can I think we can stop the recording.